All right. Uh, well, good morning. Welcome to uh, space <laughs> uh, or the moon or whatever, wherever we are uh, for VBS. You guys, what a, what a great time. If, you've, if you haven't been a part of our, of our VBS weeks and stuff, um, boy, come be a part. It's always so much fun um, playing and enjoying telling stories for the kids and bringing them into the story of the scriptures and Bible, all that. So, um, and even if you don't, even if even if you don't have a role to play or a, or a, or a place in which you're volunteering, uh, man, you're you're welcome to to show up and and just see, um, sit over on the edge and just kind of watch um, things happen. It's good. It's fun. So, uh, welcome this morning um, to our uh, worship time together. Um, this morning, as we as we get into it, this week, um, this week the devotional has been talking about forgiveness, and um, uh, and so so this morning, what what I want to get into when we get into the sermon and all the rest is is ultimately what it is that um, that God is is trying to do in the in the world, and so when you hear this hear this invocation, uh, this opening prayer. I want I, I want to comment on the other side of it just real quick to kind of set us up for the conversation this morning and what and what this what this is for us that God is at work even in the challenges of life um, and and usually when God is at work in the challenges of life it has to do with other people coming alongside of us and being with us and standing us up and speaking life and hope so so anyways it, thank you for being here because that's what. It is. Church is not just church to show up because they you know that's Sunday morning to check off. No, it's it's that we come together to say, hey, um, we we love and care for one another and we want to be with one another uh, in those times and to speak life and hope over one another. So here's the invocation. You are loving, merciful and forgiving. Oh, God, you pardon our wrongdoing and cover our transgression. May we forgive and pardon others as you have forgiven and pardoned us so that we, as a forgiven and reconciled people, glad and upright in heart, may rejoice in you. O Lord, this day and always we pray. Amen. Um, If you catch it, the the reciprocation of this idea of forgiveness, right relationship with one another, that as we learn to forgive others, and others learn to reciprocate that forgiveness. There's this almost snowball effect of forgiveness and pardon. And don't, don't hear me wrong. That, that doesn't mean that people are free to do us harm in order that we might have to forgive and pardon. That's not, that's not the way that works. But the idea is that, that this life in Christ, this life in God, is that, is that as we pour out, then the hope is that as the Spirit works in this life, Others then catch it. Others then pour out. Others catch it. Others pour out. And on and on it goes for ultimately the shalom of the world. So as we get into the sermon, we're in Romans uh, chapter 8 still. And when we get into there, um, it is still about, uh, man, God is at work in the world, even in the challenges. Um, And so may we be a people that step into that role and participate well in God's kingdom come and his will being done on this earth as it is in his heaven. Amen? Amen. All right. Kristen has got announcements, and then we'll continue on. Oh, excuse me. Good morning. It's VBS week. Yay. Okay, you're going to have to bring more energy than that to VBS. Kids will literally leave if they're like, this is a snooze fest. So it's going to be a super great week. Speaking of VBS, um, we will not have regular activities at the church this Wednesday because it will be taken over by kiddos, and it's going to be awesome. So go ahead and come, even if you're not a volunteer or you're not participating, but maybe you would normally be here on Wednesday night. Come check it out. Come see what's going on Um, in the middle of our VBS week. My child's choking. Are we good? Please be good. Yeah, that was a breath. Okay. Okay. Um, yay for life. Okay, um, I just got rid of my announcements. Um, so that's happening Wednesday, so we're not having normal activities. Um, however, normally during the week, 
We have youth group every Wednesday where there's always dinner provided. Um, hallelujah. And there's always prayer, um, except for weeks like this when there's not. But um, if you're not involved with um, one of those areas, um, come check us out on Wednesday night. There's, there's lots going on. There's community to be part of. Um, there's things to participate in in the life of the church, and it is good to be together more than just on Sunday mornings. Um, with that, we also have um, some small groups that meet regularly. We have one on Sunday mornings, and then there are opportunities throughout the week as well. Um, I don't know why this keeps going away. Anyway, um, so if you are not plugged into one of those, um, we would highly encourage you to to get connected. Um, those are options that you can see uh, Michelle Vinton about or Karen Davis. There's meets on Sunday mornings. Or check out um, with Pastor Chris or Pastor Cherie about the one they host at their house throughout the weeks. Um, yeah, and then if there's ever one that you would want to start on your own, there's always space for that. So we're looking for more and more opportunities for you to um, get involved, want to provide plenty of those chances because we don't want people to say, oh, I just don't feel connected. Um, we want to give you ample opportunity to actually um, connect with the body in more ways than just sitting together on Sunday. Um, okay, we have a church work day coming up. Um, yay! <laughs> a church work day coming up on August 19th. That's a Saturday. Um, we'll just be here from 9 to 1, so hopefully we'll be here before it gets too hot. Just put, come help us put in a few hours and really get this place um, like at its best, um, shining like the top of the Chrysler building. If you've ever seen Annie, that's the goal. Um, and we want to um, continue putting our best foot forward, and sometimes that means um, sweating a little bit for uh, the kingdom and um, for us to be able to do ministry here. There are um, various things that need um, that need cleaned, that need um, just like a good deep scrubbing because we can't get in there quite so deeply every week, things that need a little bit of maintenance and tuning, um, and if you have... Um, an able body, we can absolutely use you. If you need to sit in a chair and clean some toys, we can use you. So it's going to be awesome. Um, so come out for that. I bet there will be at least coffee. So um, please join us. It'll be really great if we can have some extra hands to help us for things that are coming up in the fall. Like, for example, we are again hosting the NDI convention. Um, that is in the end of September. Um, and so we need volunteers. Um, last time that they came, that was last May. If you were here, we had a church work day before that to kind of really tune up the church before the district came in. And they came. And there were so many people. And so we need people to just even make sure that the paper towels stay stocked in the bathroom throughout the day. We need people to help greet. Um, we will have sound needs. If you're um, in that department that you work, we'll have um, needs of just setting up tables and chairs um, before the event begins, of moving some things around throughout the day, um, helping um, set up their lunch, helping clean up, all of those sorts of things. There is a lot that goes into hosting events, and this is a big one. So if you um, are feeling like you just want to be able to give a couple hours, if you're in high school and you have community service hours, that's a great way to um, get those taken care of and checked off. Um, Lots of ways that um, you can serve and help specifically for that event. So thanks for getting that on your radar. Think about it. Um, I don't have a specific date for you, but end of September on a Saturday. And, um, yeah, that's, that's coming up, and that's a need. We still are needing participants and volunteers in all areas of the church. Um, we need a lot specifically um, coming up in the fall in the, uh, the youth group. Um, and then in our children's department as well. Um, so if you have been waiting for somebody to just ask you to start and jump in, here it is. Come on, um, join the team. Um, it's a really, really good time. It's my favorite area to serve in, for sure. And uh, I would highly um, appreciate your help and your time and your talents and um, the opportunity for you to pour into some of our kids, our little guys all the way up to um, our students who are adults now. Um, but those are ways that you can serve. We also need um, just regular help with, like, regular maintenance of the church. We've had some people jump in and say, hey, I want to help clean. We love that. Um, people who want to come pull weeds, we love that. People who um, are able to help um, Pastor Chris at the end of the season with the swamp coolers and 
any of those other sorts of things that go into the running of a building. Um, we could absolutely use um, your, your skills, and if you don't have skills, we'll teach you some skills, but a yes is what we'd love to, <laughs> to have, and we can work with that. Um, okay, and then the only other thing that I have um, is that this today, out right after the service, we'll have like five minutes in between, and then anyone who is volunteering with VBS um, in any capacity, if you are running sound, if you are just dropping off some snacks, if you are um, like leading a group, whatever, the if you don't know what your role is yet, I'm going to tell you today. Um, if you have not yet had a chance to volunteer and you'd still like to, great, we can use you. We'll have an, a meeting um, right here, um, just up at the front here in the sanctuary after the morning service is over. So we'll have a few minutes, run to the bathroom, grab a cup of coffee, say goodbye to someone, and then I'll meet with you for like 10, 15 minutes and you'll be out in time for lunch, I promise. Um, so that will be super helpful. There won't be another chance for us all to be together for me to address you on like what's happening this week. So we'll just go over all the things so that no one is feeling like, I don't even know what's happening with VBS. <laughs> so um, please make that a priority if you're able to just stay for 10 or 15 minutes after the service. Um, and we will get you out of here um, with all the info that you need. And if you need another incentive, I have a little thank you for all of you. So um, stay after. And um, thanks to those of you who have already helped with all of this setup. This took a lot of work, but um, if I did not have help, it would have taken, oh my word, so much more time. So thanks to all of you who have given of time and energy and to those of you who donated um, any resources or um, funds or time as well. And speaking of donating, thanks for continuing to give in your tithes and offerings. Seriously, um, it's, it's a side of the church that we don't want to talk about, but... Um, your, your giving makes this place run, and so um, we appreciate your faithfulness um, in that, and uh, yeah, so continue to give of your time, your tithes, your offerings, your talents, all of those things, and thanks for participating in the family, in the body with us. Um, so, stand up. I'm done talking. Greet each other. Tell somebody they look good. And tell somebody how good this uh, VBS looks. Like, you just wish that you could be a kid so you could be part of it.
as we find our way back to our seats, um, I, I uh, want you to know that I appreciate your prayers these last two weeks. For me, as I've been out of the state, um, leading two different camps, one in Intermountain District, which is in Idaho, and one in Northwest District, which is um, Washington, and uh, flew into Spokane and then drove about an hour and a half to this camp. And there were hundreds of junior hires and senior hires that I was able to love on. And one of the things that um, God continued to relate to me is, uh, Shri, would you, through the whole time that you're speaking, make sure that they know that I love them. And I was telling the worship team this morning and the, the tech team as we were praying together, one of my favorite things that happened it was the very last um, moment before I left on Friday morning to head home this last week. And this little kid, junior higher, I'm assuming, came up to me, and um, we had just finished Friday morning chapel. And he came up to me, and he said, with tears in his eyes, barely able to speak, he said, thank you. Thank you for speaking this week. Thank you for preaching. And he said, um, I have felt so, so loved. And one of the major messages through that week was not only that they're loved, but they're called and they're important and they're needed in the kingdom of God. And, and he, I hugged him and he caught his breath a little bit and he said, I came here an atheist. And I said, how'd that work out? And he said, I've never felt so loved. And I said, well, he does love you. And he said, I know. And I had to catch my breath as I thought, God, you're just so kind. That there's times in our life, even for those of us who sit in this room, that we need to remember that we're called and that we're loved and that we're important and we're needed in the kingdom of God. So this morning, I hope that you know that, that you're called and you're loved and you're important and you're needed. So let's sing together. Would you stand? Let's sing, God So Loved.
Lord, and we're going to declare his joy, his praises. Amen. We worship the God who was. We worship the God who is. We worship the God who evermore will be. He opened the prison doors and he parted the raging sea. My God, he holds the victory. Oh, there's joy in the house of the Lord. There's joy in the house of the Lord today. And we won't be quiet when we shout out your praise. We won't be quiet. We shout out your praise. Oh, 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 oh. We sing to the God who heals. We sing to the God who saves. We sing to the God who always makes a way. Cause he has from that grave, my God still running stones away. Oh, there's joy in the house of the Lord. There's joy in the house of the Lord today. And we won't be quiet. We shout out your praise. There's joy in the house of the Lord. Our God is surely in this place. And we won't be Shout out your praise. All right, let's sing these words. We were the beggars, but now we're royalty. We were the prisoners, but now we're running free. We are forgiven, accepted, redeemed by his grace. Let the house of the Lord sing praise. We were the beggars, lift your voices. forgiven, accepted, redeemed by His grace. Let the house of the Lord sing praise. There's joy in the house of the Lord. There's joy in the house of the Lord today. And we won't be quiet. We shout out your praise. There's joy in the house of the Lord. Our God is surely this time to read scripture to remain standing for the reading of God's word happy are those whose transgressions are forgiven whose sin is covered happy are those to whom the Lord imputes no iniquity and in whose spirit there is no deceit while I kept silence, my body wasted away though my, through my groaning all day long. For day and night your hand was heavy upon me and my strength was dried up as by the heat of the summer. Then I acknowledged my sin to you and I did not hide my iniquity. I said, I will confess my transgressions to the Lord and you forgave the guilt of my sin. 
Therefore, let all who are faithful offer prayer up to you at a time of distress. The rush of mighty waters shall not reach them. You are a hiding place for me. You preserve me from my troubles. You surround me with glad cries of deliverance. I will instruct you and teach you the way you should go. I will counsel you with my eye upon you. Do not be like the horse or the mule without understanding, whose temper must be curbed with bit and bridle, else it will not stay near you. Many of the torments of the wicked, but steadfast love surrounds those who trust in the Lord. Be glad in the Lord and rejoice, O righteous, and shout for joy, all you upright in heart. Amen. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God.
Spirit of Spirit of the living God Spirit of the living God We only want to hear your voice We're hanging on every word Amen Amen Kids, you are dismissed this morning for Kids Church Let's remain in a spirit of prayer as we come to the Lord. God, may it be you that we both seek and see. May it be your spirit that we lean into as you shape us and you move us in your ways. As you continue to purify our hearts and our minds and our souls, that we might live a life that you have called us to. As the psalmist say, that we would not uh, need a bit and bridle. Hmm. That we would be compliant to your call in our life. God, that we would live well under your rule and your reign that you would shape us. God, forgive us those places that we are distracted, that we move our eyes from you. God, we confess this morning those spaces in which we are challenged. When we think of all the tensions in life and all the things in which we face that are uh, anxiety-ridden, God, we come before you with desire, with desire for you, for your kingdom, for your grace, for your mercy, for your forgiveness, your salvation. God, make us a people that reflect you in all the ways. And God, this morning as we crack open your word, I ask God that you would guide us, and that you would direct us, and that you would speak over us your words of truth. God, would you bless these moments? Would you redeem those spaces in us? God, may we see the goodness that you desire for this life, and may we chase after it. Thanks, God, for being in our midst. Thanks, God, for working out your truth and your goodness in our lives. Amen. Um, this morning we jump in to Romans again. We've been in a maybe, maybe albeit loose sermon series. Uh, we haven't like, you know, we haven't cultivated and made like this sermon series, but we have been talking about God's good news. The, the good news. What is the good news? And the good news is this. 
God is at work in the midst of life's trials, in the midst of life's tensions. God is at work in our frailties. God is at work in our problems. God is at work in our brokenness. God is at work in all of creation for the redemption of creation. God is still at work. That is the good news. Amen. You can go home now. Right? I mean, that's, that's, the, that's the good news. And you know what? Guys, I know that it is hard sometimes. It's hard. Life can throw us zingers. And it can stink. And I'm sorry for that. I, I am. I'm, I'm sorry for that. Uh, we've experienced zingers <laughs> Sometimes it's self-inflicted. Sometimes it's from the outside. Sometimes it's just simply the challenges that life presents us. And man, i sorry for those moments. But the good news is God is still at work for our good. There is still hope in the midst of those spaces. And that's where Paul is in most of Romans, <laughs> particularly chapter 8. I'll read it. Chapter 8, we're going to start in verse 26. I'll read through 39. Um, and yeah, we'll get into it. I'm reading out of the Common English Bible, and let me just say off the top, this, is, this was an interesting finding for me. It may not matter for you because my guess is, let me just ask, how many of you are reading out of the New International Version, NIV? Probably most of us, but here, here's the thing. So in college, um, we, we, were, we were instructed to use the NRSV, the, the New Revised Standard Version. Um, and the reason for that was it was a little more on the academic side, but still readable. Does that make sense? Um, um, NIV is more just bent towards the readable. Um, and, and that's not bad. That's a whole other conversation that we can have about translation of the Bible and what, and what certain translators were trying to do with certain translations, all that kind of stuff. It's a whole other conversation. But this one's important for us today just in case. So the NIV is, generally I've gotten used to the NRSV, but here's the thing, the NRSV is not helpful in this passage. It, was, it caught me a little off guard, to be honest with you, this week as I was studying it. The NRSV says, well, we'll get there in verse 28, that all things work together for good to those who love the Lord. Oh, that sounds great. It sounds good. Anybody, NIV, what does yours say? Do all things work together for good, or does God work together for good in your translation? I'm just pointing this out because I find it important as we read different passages. Huh? God works. God causes all things. That's NIV? Sorry, which one? NASB, okay, yeah, yeah. So, so my point here, before we get going, before we get going into this, my, my point here is this, that different translations speak different ways. And this one I found important. I'm reading out of the Common English Bible, and it reads more similar to the NIV. And, and catch it when we get to verse 20, 28. So starting in verse 26. In the same way, the Spirit comes to help our weakness. We don't, we don't know what we should pray, but the Spirit himself pleads our case with unexpressed groans. The one who searches hearts knows how the Spirit thinks because he pleads for the saints consistent with God's will. And here it is, verse 28. We know that God works all things together for good for the ones who love God, for those who are called according to his purpose. We know this because God knew them in advance and he decided in advance that they would be conformed to the image of his son. That way his son would be the first of many brothers and sisters. 
those who God decided in advance would be conformed to his son. He also called. Those whom he called, he also made righteous. Those whom he made righteous, he also glorified. So what are we going to say about these things? If God is for us, who is against us? He didn't spare his own son, but gave him up for, all, for us all. Won't he also freely give us all things with him? Who will bring a charge against God's elect people? It is God who acquits them, who is going to convict them. It is Christ Jesus who died even more, who was raised and also is at God's right side. It is Christ Jesus who also pleads our case for us. Who will separate us from Christ's love? Will we be separated by trouble or distress or harassment or famine or nakedness or danger or sword? As it is written, we are being put to death all day long for your sake. We are treated like sheep for slaughter. But in all things, we win a sweeping victory through the one who loved us. I am convinced that nothing can separate us from, God, from God's love in Christ Jesus our Lord. Not death or life, not angels or rulers, not present things or future things, not powers or height or depth or any other thing that is created. Nothing can separate us from the love of God. None of our brokenness, none of our life's tensions, nothing can separate us from the love of God. Hmm. So I wonder, has anybody ever tried to change? Have you ever tried to change? You think about things in life and you think about the way you are and the way things are and you think, you know what, I'm going to change some things. I'm going to make some alterations to my life. How'd it go? It is hard. And it's hard. You know, I don't even know how long it's been that I've set my alarm clock at 5 a.m. because I think, man, a good pastor would be up early. He would be up at the crack of dawn, praying, reading in his scriptures. And, and my alarm clock for months has been going off at 5 a.m. You know what time I've been getting up? 5.30, 6, maybe 5.38, you know. You know, it's, it's hard to, you get into rhythms, you get into habits, you get into particular ways of being. And then, of course, you know, you, you end up staying up a little later in the night, so five o'clock comes earlier and all the rest. There's certain ways of being in the world that when we try to change things, man, it's hard. It's, it's hard to readjust the ways in which, the habits in which we form in ourselves. Maybe you've experienced this this way. You go to the doc, and the doc says, hey, Chris, I mean, hey, so, you know, um, your cholesterol is a little hot. You should eat more veggies, and you should do all these things. To and you think, Okay, roger that. Cool. We'll do that. We'll change my diet for the sake of my health, and that's a big deal. So, yeah, that should be no problem. Thanks, doc. Off we go. And, and what do we do? We go home, and we make all the same meals. Because why? Well, we've come to like those meals. That's why we make those meals. We like them. We, we get into the rhythm of it. You know, green chili chicken enchiladas, that's pretty easy. You just cook the chicken, throw the sour cream in there, whatever, or the cream cheese in there, and you do all your thing. You cook it up, and bam, there's meal. It's easy. You're done. So not only is that change fighting against your taste buds, it's fighting against your particular habits, right? It's fighting against the rhythms in which we live into. It becomes a deal. It's hard to alter and change something. How many people in church have ever heard the words, well, we've never done that before? Right, we can make fun. We can tease the church about that. It's not the church that's the only entity of people that that's a struggle for. Uh, most organizations, you've probably worked in those kind of organizations where change starts to happen and you're like, whoa, 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 whoa. We've not done it that way. When I worked at Sierra Trading Post, as a church planter, I got a job there, so I took it and that's what we needed. That's where I was. Sierra Trading Post, this was before Sierra Trading Post was just Sierra. 
It was before they were TJ Maxx. It was just a mom and pop shop. There was just Bobby and Keith Richardson's, the owner. They would stop in. They would say hi. When they sold the company for like $200 million, they gave us all bonuses. It was like mom and pop, and they were great. And it was lax. It was easygoing. You had a key fob to the back door. You could come and go as you please. It was just kind of just mom and pop. Corporation, though, corporate, we all know that word, corporate, comes in and doesn't act like mom and pop. You begin to change some things. There's all sorts of things, right? Right, Casey? Mom and pop have shrinkage, right? It's like there's stuff walks out the door in mom and pop. And so corporate says, hey, we can't have that. We can't have the stuff walking out the door. We can't have theft, so let's tighten things up. Take your key fob. You can't go as you please. Here's the the honest truth. We could no longer go out the back door as we wanted. And every time we left the building, whether it was for a 10-minute break or for lunch or at the end of the day, we had to walk to the front of the room with the manager or the manager on duty or whatever and, and actually get a little search down. Things changed and a lot of us said no this is dumb i don't like it but but corporate corporate had now forgive me this metaphor is going to get blurry but but hang with me corporate says we have a plan down here that is good for business we have a plan over here and so we need to get to that plan we need to get to that way of being because then things are going to work and operate a little more efficiently. It's, gonna, it, it's just going to be more streamlined. We're, gonna, we're, gonna, we're not going to spend as much money. We're going to earn more money. There's all these things. They have a plan at the end of their day. And they're saying, y'all are going to get in line or not. It's kind of the deal. So come with us. Do these things. Get your, you know, get your quick pat down before you leave. Do, walk through these ways, and we're going to get to this end goal. And this end goal is going to be good. Change is hard, even if it is for the good. Now, don't hear me. I'm not trying to make corporate some sort of god or whatever. But can you see the trajectory that's happening here? God has a plan that we were predestined for. We were made to live in shalom and harmony with God and one another. And God has this plan that will be fulfilled. There's going to be hardship in the change. There's going to be difficulty because there's these two worlds that we're working with. We're working with the heavenly world. We've talked about this before. We're talking about this heavenly space and this earthly space and the collision of the two coming together. Change begins to happen. And those who are in Christ are in the middle of that change. Understand it this way. In the Old Testament, there was a tabernacle. The tabernacle was that space set apart to say, this is the heavenly realm here on earth. And we go to the tabernacle to experience God on earth. And labor, right, labor, later from the tabernacle, it was, it was the, it, it was the um, temple. Thank you. <laughs> the temple. Um, the church, the building, the big Solomon's, yeah. Um, anyways, so, so there's these spaces that happen throughout Scripture. You can even find them outside of those elements where, you know, M- Moses is up on the mountain. God's space shows up on earth with Moses. And we can go on through the Scripture and find those moments. But in Jesus, Paul is contending that in Jesus, the heavenly realm, that God space has, has crashed into, it has shown up here on earth 
as it is in heaven. It's not heaven's out there. And, and, and no, in Jesus, heaven has shown up here on this earth. And then as the Spirit is pour, poured out on people, we then become the little light that declares God's space here on earth as it is in heaven. And so Paul is saying, look, you guys, there is a trajectory here. God has a plan for ultimately the final consummation of all God's good purposes to take place here on earth, right? John 3, 17, that all creation would be saved through him. God's got a plan that's out there in the future that is for our good purposes. And the invitation for humanity by God himself is to say, hey, will you participate me, with me in that end result trajectory? Will you, will you work with me in this space? Will you participate with me as we create God's space in earthly physical space. But Paul is not naive. He says it. He says, man, it's tough. He's talking to the Romans. Remember, these are, these are a Roman church under Roman rule. Rome was rough, and Rome was not necessarily friendly with Christians. If Christians acted like Rome, then cool. Uh, but if Christians decided to love better than Rome or take care of people better than Rome took care of them, Rome gets a little jealous. And the tensions begin to rise. People seem to think, oh, or the Romans, the Roman gods, Caesars, begin to think, hey, that guy, that guy's gaining popularity more than me, right? And so the tensions rise. We, we know this. Whoever, whoever determines they are God There's tensions. Whoever we determine is God of our life, if it's not God, there's tensions that rise. This is the collision between the earthly world and the heavenly world. God says, no, I am God, and I am God alone, and my ways will take us into my future goodness. So will you participate with me in this? I want to get into this from a friend of mine. Um, this, this passage, I tell you what, I was wrestling pretty hard with it this week. And so I text a handful of pastor friends of mine. I'm like, hey, what are you doing with this passage? And I don't know what, one of the, 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 the guy I'm going to read from, and then I'll interject as we go. The guy I'm going to read from, though, uh, he's not lead pastor. He's on staff. He just moved away from here, and he's on staff in Idaho. And he wrote this. He's a, he's a, a biblical and Hebrew scholar um, that's just a heap of fun to talk to and spend time with in his knowledge of that. But he writes in response to Romans chapter 8. Um, and, and let's understand, Romans chapter 8, he already set us up with the last part of Romans chapter 7. I commented about it, I think, two weeks ago. Romans chapter 7, he's like, you know, you know how it is. You know the tension. You know the tension of life. There's the things that you don't want to do, and you do anyways. And then there's the things that you do want to do, and you don't do them? You you know the tensions of this life. And then he goes on to chapter 8. And this is what my friend Scott writes. He says, Paul is unpacking the hope of the Christian life, the future resurrection of the body, the renewal of all creation. In the meantime, we have the presence of the Spirit is a down payment of all that is yet to come. And a reminder that God is at work in both the already and the not yet. The already, Jesus has come. The not yet, the full consummation of God's redemptive work in the world. We live in this space. God is at work in the tension. So the Holy Spirit resides inside our still human body that is awaiting full restoration to glory at the parousia of Christ, the end of time for Christ's return. Currently, 
uh, yeah, at the end of glory, the perusia of Christ, and currently serves as an anchor of hope while we live in the in-betweenness of being renewed spirit inhabiting a yet-to-be-renewed body in a still-fallen but yet-to-be-renewed world. Catch what's going on here. There's tensions in this life. There's challenges in this life. We're going to look and we're going to see all of them. And more and more in our world, I think we feel them. We feel the tensions. We feel the anxiety. The, the underlying murmurings, right? Gun control, abortion control or not. We, we feel all these things. You guys, the list is long, right? One side of the aisle, the other side of the aisle, and it goes on and on and on, and we feel it. Sometimes it comes to a head, and everybody's like, whoa. But generally, in our day-to-day life, there's just this underpinning rumbling. This is the rise of anxiety and culture. And the Roman churches felt the same way. And Paul is saying, you feel that? You feel that tension? That tension is not without God's participation and work in the midst. He's not causing the tensions per se. He's not causing the troubles. Except that when he calls us to goodness and we don't want to, then maybe he's causing the trouble. Or maybe we are. (laughs) That God is at work for the end redemption of the world. So Scott goes on and currently serves as a a world. Sin, death, and the spiritual enemies of God are still active agents in the world. So bad things will keep happening. Tensions will keep happening. God does not cause or desire or even plan these bad things. They're the result of still fallen world where disease, injustice, violence, and selfishness are still active. But our hope is knowing that a day will come when both our body and all creation will be redeemed so that we can trust God is still at work and will bring about His ultimate goodness at that time. The already promise, the already promise of this is the presence of His Spirit in us now because we were created very specifically to be renewed in the image of Christ. That is our ultimate destiny. We were predestined for it. In other words, we were created to live in perfect harmony with God and one another. This does not in any way negate our free choice to receive our destiny. We have a destiny all, every one of us, and we can choose to participate or get caught up in it, or we can be the horse or the mule that needs a bit and a bridle, right? Uh, We have currently been renewed in that destiny in our spirit and await the renewal of our body, our glorification. Paul closes in reminding the Roman believers of this, and that they are secure in their position of Christ, regardless of the bad things happening all around them, a still fallen world. So this whole pericope must be read in light of Paul's already and not yet to come eschatology. Bad is just the result of sin and death that God is still fighting against and the beachhead established at the cross, resurrection, and Pentecost. The story of Jesus is a story declaring God's redemptive acts in the world in the midst of this timeline. Creation, parousia, end of time, Christ's return. He showed up here in the middle and declared his goodness over all creation and is calling, drawing, wooing all of us into that space that is shalom. God's peace, God's peace, God's shalom, understanding peace is not simply the absence of the tension. 
Shalom, God's shalom is indeed translated peace, but it is bigger than our understanding of peace, peace without tension, without war. No, God's shalom is not just peace for some people. Shalom is the flourishing of all of creation, all of people. That if we are to live into his shalom, then all of creation begins to participate in it. That is the reciprocating snowball that our invocation spoke to. That if we would be a people that perpetuate God's goodness in this earth, then we are participants in what is to be and what is to come. Amen? I I took, I, I, I adapted, if you would, uh, hear this invocation, um, or this, sorry, this benediction. I, I, I took the psalm reading for this Sunday, uh, and not the psalm Jeff read, but that, that was the psalm for the week and the devotional. This is the Sunday psalm, and I took it to, uh, and, and adapted it for this benediction. I know I'm, man, I feel like I'm really short today. Am I really short today? You good? So if you would, if you are able, stand with me and hear this benediction as I adapted this psalm for a benediction. This was Psalm 32. God's laws are wonderful. May you guard them. Access to God's words gives light. May you gain understanding and long for God's commandments. May the Lord come back to you and have mercy on you. That's only right for those who love his name. May the Lord keep your steps steady by his word and not let any sin rule in your life. Redeem your people, O God, so that they can keep your precepts. Shine your face on your servants and teach us all your statutes. Amen. Amen. Go in his peace.